You might know Anna Tyree from the huge English Like a Native YouTube channel, which now boasts over a million subscribers and reaches tens of millions of English learners every single month. But the path to get there was not always simple. So in this interview, I am gonna quiz Anna on her journey, what it took to get there, the highs and the lows. And I'll ask her about the reality of running one of the most popular YouTube channels for English learners in the world. We'll talk about juggling different channels. We'll talk about her journey as a creator. We'll talk about her most popular but most controversial video and how she found out that it's not all about pleasing the algorithm. So let's get right into it. I hope you will enjoy my conversation with Anna Tyree. Hello everyone, I am thrilled to have Anna Tyree from the English Like a Native YouTube channel and podcast with me today. Hello Anna. Hello, how are you? I am wonderful, how are you? Very good, I'm keeping warm. It's very cold here in London at the moment. Yeah, what, uh, what is the temperature? Minus five this morning. Ooh. So uh, my son and I were admiring Jack Frost's work as we walked to school. Very good. Well, I hope uh, hope you're keeping warm inside and your son is well wrapped up. He is. He is. He's at school. They have the heating on there, so he's all right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I've asked Anna to come and speak today as Anna has a super interesting background being uh, a world-renowned YouTuber, I can perhaps say, huh? C- certainly in the, the world of English learning and also having a very successful podcast. And I wanted to talk to Anna today a bit more about her experience as a YouTuber and a podcaster, how she has kind of managed these two dual things, and also learn a bit more about her view as as an English teacher, I guess, uh, on how learners should think about podcasts versus YouTube. So... Anna, can I just start by asking you to tell me a little bit more about your kind of journey as uh, as a YouTuber? Because if I'm not mistaken, that came before your podcast. Yes, that's right. Um, I've been YouTubing for nearly a decade, I think it must be. I've lost count. But I started with YouTube kind of like everybody did initially. I had a YouTube channel simply to store my own personal videos. And then as I became um, more involved in the arts, because I originally trained as an actress, uh, I used it to showcase my acting work. And when it turned into a business for me was actually teaching singing. I used to teach all sorts of different things from elocution through to singing, drama, and my singing students weren't very good at doing their homework in between our like fortnightly sessions. And so one day, very frustrated, I thought, I'll grab my camera and I'm going to record our singing exercises. And so there's no introduction. There's no expectation that anyone who doesn't know me would see this video. And I go straight in and I do our regular kind of singing exercises to camera. I put it on YouTube and I say to my students, Here's the link. Please use it several times a week. And then when I see you next time, hopefully there'll be some progress. And then months go by and one day I get a payment from Google. And I thought, hang on, why am I getting money from Google? And obviously uh, found that it was actually from YouTube and the video I'd put up had received lots and lots of views. So I was I was gobsmacked. I never saw YouTube as a way to find people. I never understood that there were algorithms that would do the job of finding your audience. I just assumed that if you put something on YouTube, it was only found through sharing a link or other people sharing it. So um, so it was a big surprise. And I thought, oh, OK, well, maybe this is something I could do a little bit more of. So I made a few more videos and they also started making money. And that's when I really started to think this could be a viable option for someone who was initially interested in just being an actress. This is something I could do on the side. Okay, wow. Um, And then I started experimenting with other forms of YouTube. I was vlogging. um, I was doing challenge videos. And then I started 
putting out elocution videos, more education. Um, and of everything I did, it was the English channel, the English like a native channel that started to really grow. And at some point you have to say, I'm going to take that leap. I'm going to give up my normal work that I do day to day and I'm going to focus all my energy and time into building a YouTube channel um, which is scary because it's hard to make money <laughs> but um, but I did it and I think that was back in 2017 18 and uh, the, your first yeah, I haven't, haven't like looked an, back since I actually looked the first video I think you made on YouTube was from uh, sorry the first video on the English like a native channel that is still up there at least. It was from July the 24th of 2016 and was yes. A versus Anne. Yes. Yes, I thought I would start at the very beginning. <laughs> start well, with the basics. It's an important thing to get right. Uh, and so when you first started, did you have lots of different channels and you were uploading to the relevant content yeah. to each channel? Yeah, and I still do have those channels with an expectation that at some point in my life, I'll go back to them. So I have um, a travel vlog called Anna's Big Adventure, which um, I would love to get back to when I'm back to traveling. I just don't do many um, trips anymore because of the children. But when I do, I would hope that I would start travel vlogging again. Um, the singing channel, I probably won't ever go back to. It continues to be a valuable resource for people. Um, who enjoy singing and want to improve. And so I'll leave that up. I'm not going to take that down. Um, we have a children's channel called Bella and Beans, which I am desperate to get back to, but it takes a lot of work and uh, and it, and it's not easy to cover the production costs. So one day I might go back to that, but really I have to be very focused at this point in time and... English Like a Native is the most useful um, uh, resource that I offer and the most viable as a business from all the channels that I have at the moment. So that's where my my aim is. Amazing. And as part of my little check, but just before we started this call, I saw you are now at 991,000 subscribers. I imagine by yes. the time that people are watching this you might have crossed over a big number uh which would be very exciting uh, so yes. congratulations in advance for, for when you. that happens do you will you get some kind of nice little medal or something like that from youtube or well you get the golden you get the gold play button don't you like the at the moment i've got the silver ones i do have a, a gold one there but that's that's a fake that's a fake <laughs> That's, well, it was sent as a gift, as a fun gift to um, to my youngest son when he was born, um, as, as a gift for him. So uh, I just put it up there because there's nowhere else to put it. But yes, I'll get a real one. I'll get a real one that I've earned. Uh, so that's going to be very exciting. Well, I might make a cake or something to celebrate. Very good. Uh, so th and this was, uh, yeah, almost well, almost eight years ago now that you started the English like a like a native channel. How has the channel evolved since then? And how have you evolved in terms of your approach to making videos? So when I started out, I had no idea what I was doing, really. I didn't know who my audience were um, or what would what would work in this particular niche. So I was just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what would stick. Um, I think initially I started out trying to be very resource based. So like starting with the basics. Um, but very quickly, uh, there was a few videos that really took off and they were definitely more sensational than the basic resources. Um, and so I started learning much more about the algorithms and how that worked and how important it is to get the click. I and mean, if you get the click, then you have to hook the audience. And so it definitely changed things for me in, in that first 12 months. I went from thinking I'll just offer a, a you know, very, um, what's the word, a very planned and structured resource so students can move through from one video to another and progress to thinking, well, there's no point in doing that if I don't have an audience. And the only way to get an audience is to please the algorithm and to please the algorithm, I've got to do this, this and this and jump through hoops. So I started 
doing much more sensational stuff, stuff that maybe isn't that useful, but that definitely gets people's attention. Um, and I think I lost my way a little bit in that first like 12 to 48 months, probably. I was just a bit lost, just trying to find an audience, trying to find where I fit into the, into the niche on YouTube. Um, and after a while, it, you, you start to burn out constantly trying to please an algorithm. And after a while, I, th I think I came to the realization that it's not about pleasing the algorithm. It's about pleasing the audience. Why did I start this channel in the first place? Who am I trying to serve? What's going to really help them? And by this point, I'd started to get a feel for who my audience were. I'd started to actually meet some of my students. I'd had multiple conversations with them in the chat. Some of them had joined courses or services that I had going and and we got to know each other. And so I started thinking about them as individuals. How could I serve that person rather than thinking about a faceless, faceless algorithm? And so then I became once again, more structured, more settled, less worried about the algorithm, less worried about viral videos. Um, but of course, along the way, in the time I've been on YouTube, YouTube has changed so much. We've, we've gone from people making videos in their bedrooms, which I have to admit I was too. It might not have always looked like I was in my bedroom, but I was. Um, and it being very kind of relatable because it wasn't high production value to people making these incredible videos that could easily be on Netflix or the BBC or, you know, mainstream television. And, and then we've got shorts and now podcast being introduced. And so there's so much going on in YouTube. It can make your head spin. And I think it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So I just try and put the blinkers on. I, I, I will experiment with new things that YouTube introduces, but I always just try and think back to my student. How do I serve them? Not worry about all the big shiny things that YouTube is doing and offering and what my competitors are doing. You mm. know, I guess it can be very easy to be distracted by trying to kind of chase views and new subscribers and stuff like that. But ultimately you're far better off having a smaller number of people who absolutely love what you're doing and are kind of just waiting for every single, you know, where every next video to come out thinking, brilliant, there's, there's a new one from Anna, rather than having yeah. a whole load of people who might perhaps click on a video once because it has some very catchy name or thumbnail or fun, kind of catchy intro but realistically who are not necessarily going to be your ideal kind of person. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you had a, a bricks and mortar school and you were enrolling a group of students for the year, you want people who are actually wanting to come to school every day and do the full course, not people who will just turn up, have a look on the first day and then leave. And then you have only a, a half of the people in the class. So you, it's just about finding the right people and serving those people, but also making sure you feel good about the content you're making. Because I definitely have in the past put things out there just for the sake of pleasing YouTube, pleasing the schedule, pleasing the algorithm that I haven't felt good about, either because the quality's not been good or the subject matter's a bit loose um, or, yeah, just just not feeling like this is my best work. And, uh, and you know, in, in, later, in later times, then deleting it anyway, taking it down. Um, so I've definitely matured, I would say, on the, on the platform. Are there particular videos that have done you know, very well from the point of view of views or you know, revenue or whatever is the sort of North Star metric for you? Yeah. But you think, you know, that, that's not me, that's, that's a per poor reflection of everything that I'm able to give, even though by YouTube standards, it's a, it's a home run. So I, I yes, yeah, so the, the big elephant in the room for me is my biggest video on my channel um, teaches sex vocabulary. Now, that always makes me kind of blush a little bit. Um, there was a point when I was very much wanting to stick firm to my, my brand. My brand is native English, so not textbook English, but 
English that's spoken. So focusing on dialect and accent, focusing on slang, um, focusing on pronunciation and connected speech and um, and the kinds of English that you won't be taught because it's more sensitive. So like talking about women's periods and things like that, things that teachers in a school would not teach you, but people need if they're living in an English speaking country. Um, and I decided to do the sex vocabulary video, which I mean, it's not filthy. It's not filthy at all, but, um, you know, covers the vocabulary around that subject. I made it initially as a live stream and it did very well in terms of views, but the quality of a live stream that's recorded usually isn't very good. And this was, you know, a long time ago now, it was like eight years ago. So I didn't have the fantastic software that can make you look good in a live stream that would put comments on the screen and, you know, allow you to share graphics and things while you're streaming. It was just me sitting there, like writing things on a whiteboard. Um, and I think that got like a quarter of a million views which was amazing. I thought this is brilliant, but I didn't feel good about it. So after a while I thought, look, this is my best performing video, but I don't feel good about it. So why don't I remake it? So years later I remade it. And so I replaced it with a properly produced video. That video now I think has had um, about 9 million views or something, millions of views. It did very well, but it, it did very well on all fronts. It did very well to bring in money and bring in subscribers and bring in views. But I had to kill it because I could see that the majority of my traffic was coming from external and that I was the people who were searching the search terms were things that were just a bit filthy, a yeah. bit inappropriate, not English related. And that was never my intention. You know, I, I, it's not a filthy video and it actually still is live. So people can see it. Um, but it, it's just, it was being put in playlists for like pornographic playlists. And I was just like, this is not, this yeah. is not the face of, of this brand. This is not what I'm proud of. I also had a very successful children's channel at the time as well. Bella and Beans was have, getting millions of views. It still is. And I didn't want that association so I killed it. I turned it off for a while and then I brought it back in, but changed the thumbnail, changed the title so that it would hopefully surface in a different way. Um, so yeah, that, that one and swear words, when I've covered swear words, they've always done very well. Um, but again, I'm not, I don't feel great because I'm quite, um, you know, I'm a good girl. I, I don't really, I, I, I'm a good member of society. I don't really go out swearing, effing and jeffing in front of people. And, you know, I'm, I'm polite, yeah. and conscientious. And so having myself out there teaching these bad words, I, I still stand by the fact that it's important that people know these words. They know what's acceptable because I've personally experienced, um, I, I used to live with a, a, a group of, uh, non-native. So there was a, a guy from Uruguay, a Spanish guy, um, just people from all over the place. We all lived in this big flat share. And, um, and one of them using horrific words to describe his night out, but in a very nice and, you know, gentle way, he was using these terrible words. And I had to say, do you know, that word is actually <laughs> really yeah. offensive. I wouldn't use that word if I were you. And it's like, oh, really? I didn't know. And so I feel it's important that these words are discussed and explained so that people don't get into tricky situations or accidentally offend people. But, um, but yeah, it doesn't make me feel good. I can completely appreciate that it's an important thing for people to know, but at the same time, you don't want to become, you know, this is Anna, she teaches people how to swear yeah. and how to say these words that your teacher will not have told you because, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, they're, they're, they are not found in a textbook. No, potty mouth, Anna. There we go. <laughs> potty mouth. Well, maybe that could be a, a new direction for another channel if uh, <laughs> if you so decide. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. And so uh, it's interesting to hear about your journey, kind of at the start, like seeing some seeing some success at the start, then trying to please the algorithm, kind of leaning into stuff that was going to get you views, and then kind of moving away from that direction, just focusing kind of yeah, focusing on your ideal learner. 
is your idea, your advice for someone starting a YouTube channel today, would it be just kind of try if you can just to skip that middle step and just have a very keen idea, a very kind of tight idea of who your ideal viewer is and make videos with, with them in mind? Yeah, I do. I see new people coming into the space, going through exactly the same journey, starting off with things that they want to teach and then moving into the more sensational videos in order to get the views and to grow um, and then slowly maturing away from that and going back to their kind of brand values and what they want to teach. Um, it's important, obviously, to do things that people will click on in order to grow. You've got to please the algorithm to a certain extent. But my advice to someone starting afresh would be do a lot of research. So really look around at what other people are doing and what works well. Read the comments, see what the response is to those videos and think, you know, if I were to cover that topic what 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 could I bring to it that would be different? Because we always we all offer something different, even if it's just a different tone of voice that someone else might find more interesting. Um, and then make a plan. I, I think the expectation is that when someone starts YouTube, they expect to be big and to grow really fast within a few months. But in reality, YouTube takes years that you have to make, you know, make 100 videos first like mm. go you know build a channel make 100 videos and then come back and decide is this for me or not but don't expect that after five videos that you're going to have thousands of views and thousands of subscribers it takes a long time and i always think that that first getting to your first 100 subscribers that's the hardest unless you already have some sort of audience somewhere else and then from 100 getting to the first thousand that's hard and then the 10,000 is hard and the 100,000, you know, and it's it's not um, a constant upward curve either. You can expect a build and a drop and a build and a drop. You know, one thing that works this week won't work next week. The algorithms are changed constantly. You know, it's exhausting how often they change the algorithms and it's really hard to keep up with what's working. This time last year, shorts on YouTube were just off the charts, they were taking off. I was walking down the street saying, hey guys, I'm walking on the pavement and I might fall off the curb. And you know, these are really rough videos shot on my phone, trying to teach some basic vocabulary while I was out and about. And they would get 50,000 views in a week. You know, they would do so well. I put a short out now and it might get a couple of thousand and then just die because the algorithm is constantly changing. And there's more and more material coming in that has to be sorted. Um, so if you were coming in now, I'd say do not worry about the data. Do your research, make a plan of what you're going to of what you're going to record and just get good at making videos. Don't worry about what YouTube is saying, what the views are saying. Just like hone your craft. Is that right? Hone your craft. Yeah. Get get good find your feet on camera and then after you've made a hundred videos then look back and say right what's really working what's taking off what can I do more of and consistently do research I think people like just stop watching they stop watching their other people in their niche they stop consuming if you're not a user how do you know what your users experience is and watch your own material you know, if you can watch other people watching your material, I've always found that fascinating. See where they seem to get bored um, or where they where they laugh, where they're really involved uh, and just just understand how people consume what you're creating. So it's something for the long run, YouTube. I don't think it's a quick. I'll do it and I'll get rich and famous. Yeah. So talking more about the kind of analytical side of things. Are you after every, you know, after every video kind of going in and thinking, okay, people seem to drop off after, you know, minute uh, eight. That's because I started talking about this. I, you know, that's when I started talking about this particular thing. Therefore, I, I need to think about delivering that in a different way or that subject is not so interesting to my audience. Are you getting into that level of detail? 
Yeah, YouTube is very good these days with their analytics. They give you so much information. Sometimes I think maybe a little bit too much. You can get a bit paralyzed with the amount of data they give you. But they provide it in a really useful way. So they do show you in the in the back end, in the studio, where a video has its peaks and its dips. What I t tend to find is that I will have the hockey stick. So I have the initial dip in the intro. So people click on and decide in the first few seconds, do I want to watch this or not? Um, and so I always have that dip. And, um, and I tend to then be quite steady throughout. I don't tend to have peaks and troughs. If I do then I take note of it and say, that's interesting. Why have I got the peak there? Are people rewinding to watch this section? Why? What did I say there? And of course, if I've got a drop off, but I've done this for so long now, I can almost guarantee if I see a peak and a drop, I'll be like, I know what that is. The peak is where I put all the text that I've just covered on screen. So I put the list up. So people are going back just to make a copy of the list or to just check okay. the list. And the drop is usually when I'm if I've done a sponsorship, I, I don't really do them anymore. But if I mention a brand, that's where the drop will be. Or if I just start going into something slightly unrelated to the video. Or if I go and give a signal that I'm about to end. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I might still have a minute left of content to deliver. I might want to tell them about something that's coming up or what I would like them to do. Hey, make sure you subscribe or put a comment down below and I'll respond. But that drop will start the minute I indicate that I've come to the end of the content. Okay. So I, I've done this long enough to know what, what will be happening there. Um, but yes, I, I follow my analytics. But what I've learned more recently is a video may initially flop. But then 100 days after the release, that video could all of a sudden take off. I've had a video recently take off that has been flat for a year and then like 360 days after release it suddenly like just goes through the roof with views and so this is another reason why you shouldn't put too much weight on the data in the initial stages because youtube go through cycles it will show your show your material to your subscribers, to the people who've got their notifications turned on, and then they'll start testing and they test in cycles. Um, and they'll test to bigger and bigger groups or try different groups. And so, you know, 90 days goes by, six months goes by, and they're still testing, they're testing. And if your video then starts to correlate with another video that's just been released, mm. it might test tagging your video onto the end of that video. And if that video takes off, then your video could take off. And that could be years after you've released it. Or someone might suddenly use your video as a resource and stick it on a website that starts to get lots of traffic. And for some reason, your videos just took off. Oh, it's external views because someone's embedded my video somewhere. So I, I don't think it's healthy to sit and stare at your analytics when you first release a video because it doesn't tell you enough you get an, a general gist but it doesn't tell you enough um i tend to really take the comments on board and see what the comments are like um i see what my students are saying i'm very connected to my students so anyone who's on any of my courses comes into my community and we're in a telegram group and so people have they have access to me and I'll get random messages for, on Telegram from my students saying, I've just watched this video. This is brilliant. Do you know why this is good? Because I can do it doing this or this works for this. And that's the feedback I take on board uh, and that will inform me. So I think if you are starting, kind of coming back to that question, if you are starting a new YouTube channel, try and find a way to connect with your target audience, you know, on a different platform, perhaps. Mm. Um, and because that will tell you so much more about what people want, what people enjoy, like having a focus group almost. Okay. That's really interesting. I guess also the nature of the kind of content that you are creating, it's not going to go old or, or kind of not useful in 10 years. Yeah, I mean, you evergreen, yeah, evergreen content, your, your first video and a versus Anne, or, you know, the, the one about, um, sex terms or swearing or thing like, you know, these will be as relevant in 10 years or so. So I guess uh, it's particularly useful for people making that kind of evergreen type of content, whether it's relating to learning languages or, you know, 
playing the guitar or something, which I guess is the same yeah. now as it was 25 years ago. Um, but I imagine there's many more people creating content relating to like learning English or learning languages in general now versus uh, back in 2016 when you first started. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see more and more people coming into the space and it, it can make you think, oh, is there any point? But I always think there's 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 room because not only are the not only is the base of creators growing, the base of viewers is growing. The viewership is growing. You know, YouTube is it feels like it's big to us. It feels like, you know, in, in the UK, it feels like everyone watches YouTube. But that's not the same for every country around the world. And so YouTube is slowly spreading, spreading, spreading. Um, and so there are many more viewers and we are consuming so much more YouTube than we ever did before. We now have YouTube on our smart TV. Um, <laughs> my partner was cutting uh, some of, we got some wisteria up the front of the house and he was cutting the wisteria and accidentally cut the cable that provides us with like just standard TV. Oh, no. uh, so we don't have normal TV, so oh. we can only get the internet TV. So that's like Netflix and YouTube um, and BBC iPlayer. And so that, that's our staple. Every night when we sit to watch TV, we'll our first port of call is YouTube. And that was not the case. You know, even five years ago, we weren't doing that. So our viewing habits are changing. So there's definitely, there is space for more and more content. And that's another thing. People come into the space thinking, and I did use the word competitor, which I instantly regretted because I don't see other teachers in the space as competitors. It's just a, a term that just flew out of my mouth. Um, they're more like my peers, my peers, because someone, my students tell me all the time, oh, you know, I love your videos and I always watch all of your videos and I watch videos from this person and that person and that person. So you know, one lesson a week, if you're producing weekly content, isn't enough to sustain a language learner. They're going to consume lots of content. So they're going to follow many lessons from many different creators. So there's definitely room for more. So don't let a, a saturated niche put you off if you are thinking of, of starting a channel. You know, come on in. The more the merrier. Why not? I guess also something like learning English, there are, you know, however many hundreds of millions of people kind of actively trying to improve their English now, especially at the kind of, uh, the sort of intermediate to advanced level that your ideal viewers and students are at. So even if yeah. there's, you know, some home run video that has a million views, that's still a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the total people who are probably, who would benefit from that video. So it's, yeah, yeah, I think it's very true what you say in terms of uh, yeah, uh, peers, not competitors. Um, yeah. And, and we help each other, you know, we're connected. Most of us are connected via different groups. Um, I've got the majority of the English teachers that you would probably see as being the bigger YouTubers. I've got them on my WhatsApp and we've had multiple conversations and we do help each other in times of need or collaborate, you know, so we are, we are all friends. <laughs> Um, let's let's move on and talk a little bit more about um, something different to YouTube now, which is podcasts. As mm. you, uh, as we heard, you started with your YouTube channel, and a few years ago, you decided to also start a podcast. Can you yes. talk me through your kind of rationale for doing that and how things have gone so far? So the podcast was something I wanted to do for a very long time. And I actually recorded, so the, I think the first three episodes of my podcast about like gardens and money maybe and pets were actually recorded about six months before I launched the podcast. And the reason I didn't launch it when I wanted to was because my partner is always saying, if you say yes to something, then you say no to something else. So I'm already overwhelmed. I have too much on my plate and I'm already overwhelmed with the amount of things that I do. I think at that time I was still making content for the other YouTube channels as well. And I have two young children. So I think maybe at the time I was pregnant and I don't know, maybe I had a newborn and I just had a lot on my plate and I was struggling and I'd always 
do a, a two week cycle of burnout, enthusiasm, burnout, enthusiasm, and always poorly. And so my partner was like, don't start a new project. Just don't do it. So he put me off for a while. And then one day, I think I was speaking to someone who also had a podcast. And I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to do it. <laughs> um, and so I started it secretly. The reason, the main reason behind starting it now or just over a year ago was because I've got two young children, I don't feel my best. I don't sleep well. I still don't sleep very well. My children get me up multiple times in the night. I'm constantly doing too much and burning out. Um, and so I don't feel like I look very good and, I, and my energy isn't always great. And so and when you get the camera on, that really reads on camera. I also don't always have the time to wash and blow dry my hair. So I'll wash my hair if it's dirty. I'm not like a filthy animal walking around with, <laughs> with dirty hair for weeks, but I won't want to, I don't have the time to blow dry my hair and make it look lovely. I don't have the time to put on my makeup and to make myself look camera ready and prepare the room so that it looks tidy. Um, and so, you know, a lot of wanting to go on and just do a podcast is actually because I was getting to a point where I'd feel anxious about having to turn on my camera because of all the work that would come before I could even start filming. And when you're, you know, you're paying a childminder 20 pounds per hour to look after your child. Um, and then you've got two children. So you're paying 40 pounds an hour and you have to spend one hour blow drying your hair and putting on your makeup. You know, it just starts to feel like a lot of pressure just to get ready to film for a video that might only get a few thousand views and make no money. And you're like, this is just, it just made me feel so anxious. And so the idea of just coming into my office in my pajamas, if I needed to looking like my <laughs> unpresentable self and just needing a nice hydrated voice to start recording and creating content just felt like a breath of fresh air. It allowed me to kind of reconnect with my creative side and feel excited about creating content. So that was the initial drive. I'm a little bit more in control of my life now and I can blow dry my hair at least once a week. So I, I'm back to feeling OK on camera again. But I just needed that break from having my face being recorded all the time. Um, I didn't honestly think that anyone would listen to the podcast. I didn't think it would do anything. I just wanted to do it because I enjoy it. I also, I used to do voiceover work and, you know, as a voice artist for a little while, and I really enjoyed making like radio plays. And so I thought I could be creative with my voice and enjoy that because I love, I love voice. I love voice work. Um, and so it was partly a passion project and then a just see how it goes kind of thing, just suck it and see. And uh, it's done really well and people really like it. So it's gone from being a little side project to being my main focus, which was quite a surprise for me. So it, it's it's still under the English like a native umbrella. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what I actually do now is I because YouTube have introduced their podcast platform, um, I've started putting or I was anyway putting my podcasts onto YouTube as well because many people consume their podcasts on YouTube um, but also so that I could provide more so the podcast obviously is just a listening experience but on YouTube I always put up the the words on screen so you can read as you listen so it's a kind of dual resource your as a reading resource and a listening resource and yeah, they do quite well. And so, so your your focus is completely switch, switched now from YouTube being everything to the podcast being the majority of you know, where you're putting your effort and where you see the future of English Like a Native. Yeah, I started out just doing one podcast a week and then I introduced the membership program, uh, which involves members uh, getting transcripts as well as access to bonus episodes. So I was like, okay, so now that's two episodes a week, a bonus episode and the normal episode. And then I experimented with 
drip feeding vocabulary uh, in a series called Your English Five a Day. So just doing five pieces of vocabulary a day. And I initially did it on YouTube as well as podcast back in summer of last year. It, it went down very well. People enjoyed it, but I thought, oh, I can't, I can't make that much content. And then I tried again in uh, November, maybe October, November time. And people were like, yeah, we love this. We love this. And even though they don't get as many views on YouTube, everyone was telling me like my students were, were tele, like messaging me on Telegram and saying or leaving me voice notes saying, Anna, I, I love your five a day series. I love it. And I was doing one to one sessions and my students going, by the way, I listen to your five a day on my way to work and back and I just love it. And so the fact that people were bringing this to me off the cuff without me prompting them to give me feedback made me think, well, perhaps this is something that I need to continue with. And so I, I think I've just finished recording week 16. So we've been doing it for 16 weeks of every day. So now I'm doing every a podcast day. every single day. Including um, Saturday, And I am weekends. intending. Yeah. So Saturday is one from Monday to Friday, you get five pieces of vocabulary a day. And then on Saturday, what we try to do, we don't always tell people this, but what we do is we take the vocabulary that we've been learning over the week and put it together in a bigger podcast. Although we don't, we don't say that, but that's, it's that repeti repetition, you know, like spaced repetition, basically they'll hopefully hear the Saturday episode and go, Oh, I recognize that word. I know that phrase. I heard that in the five a day. Um, and so again, it's all just thinking about the listener, just thinking what's going to serve them. How can we make it better for them? And then the Sunday episode will be a mix of things, sometimes pronunciation resources, sometimes chit chat behind the scenes, um, sometimes discussing some more vocabulary that was covered. So, yeah, it's a lot. I haven't given up on YouTube. I'm still I'm back into the swing of making videos. Um, but I am also now putting all of my podcast episodes on YouTube. That may be a mistake. I don't know if it's the right thing to do. But I'm doing it. I'm just putting it all out there, thinking about my my viewer, my listener. And, you know, if the algorithm wants to play ball, then that'd be great, too. Do you know of the people who are listening to your podcast? Do you have any idea or, you know, uh, inclination um, about the about whether these are people who followed you on YouTube and have come over or whether these are sort of podcast native type listeners who are listening to you for the first time or who discovered you through the podcast? I, I think it must be a mix because there are definitely people who follow me on different platforms, whether it's Instagram or YouTube, who have no idea, even now, have no idea that I actually have a podcast. <laughs> like, how do you not know I have a podcast at this point? Um, and there are people who have signed up to my courses. And when I do my onboarding calls with them, I'm talking to them and say, oh, you know, uh, how did you find me? And you know, what do you, what do you watch on YouTube? And, and they surprised me by saying, I found you through podcast. Um, I was originally listening to this podcast. I heard your interview. I found your podcast. I've come to your community. Um, oh, you have a YouTube channel as well. So there are definitely a, a mix. Some people who only know me on podcasts, some people who find me through other social media or just through YouTube. And so I think it's important to keep reminding people of all the different places in which they can find you so they can find their preferred method of consumption. And to, to meet people where they are, I guess, it's that if someone wants to be on YouTube and you know watching videos or even consuming podcasts on YouTube, that's great. Allow them to, to, to listen to you there versus if someone prefers yeah. to be out and about listening to you when they're walking their dog or at the gym or something like that, then podcasts are, are, are in an ideal format. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I always say to my, my fluency students on the fluency program, we, we give them a study plan of how they should make the use of the resources that we offer on the program. And one of the bits of advice that I give to all of them is listen to podcasts. So, you know, to, to improve, most people who want to improve their fluency don't listen enough. You have to get enough input to inform output. Um, and if you're traveling for half an hour, 40 minutes to work, 
and half an hour, 40 minutes back from work, that time is, is dead time. Unless you're using it to prep for a meeting or to do work, which some people do, most of the time you're just kind of sitting, scrolling through Facebook or con contemplating life um, or people watching. But you could be using that time much more productively simply by adding an English listening element. Um, I constantly listen to podcasts when I'm driving, even if it's just a 10 minute journey in the car, I'll throw on a podcast. I'm obsessed with self-improvement. So I'm always listening to things about like entrepreneurial pursuits or, um, you know, how to better manage a team or how to be more productive and stop procrastinating, um, gut health, uh, how to cook better for your family. So I'm always looking for things that will make my life better so that that 10 minutes of driving or if I'm in the gym, my 20 minutes on the on the bike or on the step machine is productive in two ways. It's it's nourishing my body because I'm doing exercise, but it's also nourishing my mind and, and helping me to to work out problems or whatever it is. Uh, and people don't have to necessarily be active listeners either. They can just listen, listen passively. I always suggest, especially for English learners, that they listen to the same podcast a couple of times. So they listen once just to get the gist. Then they listen again to really start to hear the words. Um, and ideally then when they're having a, a study session that they sit down and they actively listen. And this is why I offer the podcasts on screen with the words so that they can then start to see what they might have misheard or what they don't quite understand. And they can make a note and then do the research, find out what that word or that phrase means and then maybe add it to their own vocabulary if it's useful for them. Um, so, yeah, I think podcast has a major role to play for English learners. It's very useful just to fit in to your routine. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because uh, I was really keen to get your thoughts on you know, how YouTube versus podcasts was like the ideal diet, I guess, for an intermediate to advanced English learner, they can be confronted by, you know, hundreds of different things they could be doing, whether it's YouTube or podcasts or apps or books or reading the news or Netflix or whatever. And it's, in my experience, it's easy to be overwhelmed by these possibilities. Uh, and I guess YouTube also has the advantage or disadvantage of the fact that, you know, watch a video and immediately it's suggesting you another one about I don't know, a shark attacks and yes. like, I've got to watch that one then. The or, rabbit hole. Exactly. It pulls you in. Or I haven't seen that one about a you know, dog playing table tennis for, for a couple of weeks. So uh, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on how learners can can approach that. Uh, we already You already mentioned that podcasts are very good for kind of filling dead space, but it's important to also come back to revisit them and not think about podcasts as just something that, kind of slot in when there's nothing else. So yeah, I'd love to get your thoughts. Having educated, I guess, literally millions of people, tens of millions, I imagine, uh, on YouTube and podcasts, what is your what is your perspective on this? Uh, so every individual obviously has their own needs. I think one, one mistake that, that learners make is that they neglect the thing they like the least. So I always ask my students when they sign up to my fluency program to give themselves a score, one to five, five being very comfortable, really confident, and zero being no confidence whatsoever, terrible, on the, the skills. So how do they feel one to five on reading, writing, speaking, and listening? Um, and you've just by doing that, you get a very quick understanding of the skills that they either don't like or that they've not been able to, uh, to work on maybe because of, uh, the resources that they've had access to. Usually it's, I'm very happy with reading and writing. My speaking and listening are usually of a lower level. And those are the ones I need to work on, which is usually why they've come to us. Um, so I would encourage every student to sit down and do that, even though you might in your mind already have a view of it, it's always good to write things down because it just makes things clearer. So write down a, a score for yourself for every skill and then look and see, okay, so write down then all the things that you do 
to to work on your English that that fulfill those skills. So do I do I do any reading? Yes, every morning I read the newspaper or yes, I work in an English speaking firm. I read reports all the time. Okay, so that's more um like business based English or very specific English for that company. Um, and that industry. So maybe you need to increase your reading to include something that's a bit more um, like conversational style English, maybe like, uh, <laughs> what do you call it when it's not the broadsheets, it's the tabloids. So maybe like the tabloids or something like a magazine, um, but just some easier reading that covers a wider range of topics and vocabulary. And then you're listening. What do you do for listening? And does that really satisfy uh, what you need to improve your listening. And then what do you do for speaking and writing? Um, and when you've written it all down, you can see where the gaps are and what you need to fill. Now, the way that I set things up is that I expect people to listen to my podcast in their dead time. So listen when you're working out, listening when you're commuting, listening when you're washing the dishes or doing a, a task like painting or whatever. And then they come to YouTube or if they're a plus member, then download the transcripts that I've sent you and actively listen. So use the YouTube video then like set a time side, set time aside, <laughs> set time aside to watch and actively listen, listening out for do I understand every word? Is there anything unusual? Um, and then making lists. And so every, I can't tell you exactly how you should plan your studying for every student that comes through us. They have a completely different study plan. Some people have four hours to study and need more work on their reading and writing. Some people can only give 30 minutes a day and really need to improve their speaking, but whatever it is for you, just make sure that you're not neglecting a skill. Make sure you're putting a time aside to study and work for every skill. YouTube has all sorts of resources. Um, you can even find videos like speak with me videos. I've got a few of those on my channel. Many other creators also provide them where you'll have a script on screen and they're talking with you. It's not necessarily the same as a face-to-face -face conversation, but you're getting an opportunity to try to speak out loud. And in some cases there's no script. So you can just say whatever comes to your mind and there's a timer, you know? So I wouldn't say there is a perfect formula, a perfect balance because everyone is unique, but you can work out pretty quickly what you need and you have to be strict with yourself mm. and make sure that you're fulfilling um, those needs. Yeah. It's really interesting. The, the kind of, I guess like, uh, dead time podcasts come back to YouTube to do some active, kind of more active listening, active work with that. I think the, in my experience, the trap that people sometimes fall into, it, well, we've talked a little bit about the the YouTube kind of sidebar of death or whatever it's whatever it's actually called, <laughs> um, but it's kind of considering podcasts purely as a a kind of dead time passive listening thing, and then thinking like oh, I've I've done my listening for the day that that's it uh, I say this also in my own experience I'm learning Swedish at the moment and I'm li listening to Swedish podcasts and uh, I kind of I'll put on a podcast on the way to take my kids on the way back uh, from dropping off my kids at school in the morning and you know I, I'm kind of looking at other stuff as well I'm clearly it's a good thing to do but it's very different from sitting down and kind of thinking, right, what was that word? I can't, where have I heard that before? And how has that person used that word? So I, I think it's important to I kind of underline to people that not all activities are created equal uh, in the same way that, you know, watching a film on Netflix in English with subtitles in your own language is certainly not the same as, you know, watching one of your YouTube videos and kind of properly noting down stuff and considering it a proper active learning activity. So my only, mm -hmm. my kind of two cents on that is for people just to be conscious learners in terms of you know, choosing activities and not kidding themselves by thinking this one is just as effective as something else. Yeah. And variety. I think having variety, one activity alone you might enjoy it, but it's not going to, it's not going to cut the mustard when it comes to overall fluency. You have to vary 
the input and vary the output. So, you know, do a, a, a range of different things. Uh, indeed. Okay, well, I, I know I've taken up quite a lot of your time, Anna. Uh, my last okay. question is, what what's next for, for you? What's next for English Like a Native, both the YouTube channel and the podcast? So this year is all about um, the millions is what I'm, I'm calling this year. That's my, my focus for the year. I would like to, I'm going to hit a million subscribers this year on, on YouTube. Um, I would like to reach a million downloads on the podcast. So I'm very, I don't know how easy it is really to grow podcasts. I'm still learning in this space. I've been here for nearly a year and a half, I guess, but it, there's so little, <laughs> so little um, data that comes through on podcasts and I don't really know how to grow. So I'd like to reach a million downloads this year, uh, which I think is doable. I think it's doable. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, I just want to grow the podcast. I want to reach more people and I want to make sure that I establish myself as, uh, a, a brand that provides resource that people can use on a regular basis. I want to be a go-to resource, you know, that people use and, and, and recommend to their friends. Well, it sounds like you are, uh, you're very much on track to, to, to being there already. But uh, yeah, best of luck with uh, with your with your millions plan. Uh, I was wondering if the millions was also going to include any kind of a uh, pound number, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> but uh, it would that would be lovely. There we go. That would be lovely. <laughs> yeah, I guess the um, the subscribers and the downloads come for, come first. Um, Anna, do you want to tell anyone listening or watching this where they can find out more about you and English like a native? Yeah, so you can head over to my website, englishlikeanative.co.uk. On there, you'll also find a link to my podcast and um, all the things that we offer, fluency programs, pronunciation courses and whatnot. Or just on where, whichever platform you consume, podcast uh, or Instagram, just look for English Like a Native and you'll find my smiling face. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time and, uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too.